Hi, everybody, and welcome back to part three of our conversation uh, with Richard Hodges on the Gnosis of Gurdjieff. Bishop Laney Peterson joins us once again, filling in for Jonathan Stewart. In our last episode, we talked about the development of the soul and the concept of many eyes. We talked about some of the origins of where Gurdjieff thought may have come from, and we talked about the body, the essence, and the personality in relation to Gurdjieff's work. In this episode, we're going to talk about some interesting and unique concepts that Gurdjieff came up with to help teach his system. We're going to talk about Kunda Buffer, Food for the Moon, and his book Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson. We're also going to spend some time talking about symbols versus metaphors and the similarities and differences and where they're used. And then we're going to talk about the Law of Seven. So all of that is coming up on this episode, part three of our conversation with Richard Hodges on the Gnosis of Gurji. We we'll hope you stick around and watch the whole thing. Now, continuing with this interesting list of uh, ideas and topics that Gurdjieff came up with, uh, one that I've never heard before and <laughs> uh, sounds fun to me, uh, what is the Kunda buffer? Well, what do, you know, what do you know about it? Other than that word, nothing. <laughs> right. Well, I guess there's two things that could be said of, that he explains about it. One is that people... Uh, talk about kundalini, certain Indian yoga schools, and uh, that somehow you're supposed to uh, raise your kundalini and it rises from the base of the spine up until it goes to the third eye. And that, and he says, no, this is, this is just, uh, uh, this is just hypnotism. And that actually uh, kundalini is a, uh, is a word that was misunderstood of, from from a more ancient concept called Kunda Buffer, but any but that's that's just kind of one of his tall tales, uh, <laughs> uh, not, not to be necessarily taken literally. Um, but what is what he also explains is that, and, and again, it's it's another kind of tall tale. He likes to put things in the form of stories that that. Uh, create an image and mm -hmm. perhaps you'll get an image out of this that certain high certain high beings or archangels perhaps saw that something very uh, bad was happening or potentially happening on the planet and that uh, it seemed to have something to do with if people discovered the truth about what they were being uh, what was what was happening on earth that they would not want to continue to live, and they'd all commit suicide. I mean, he sort of, sort of says that. And therefore, they implanted in the human body at the base of the spine this organ called Kunda buffer, which caused people not to see reality as it really is, but to see everything upside down. Hmm. And by that, he meant to see themselves at the top of everything, to have this great ego hmm. and this great sense of man as something super special in the universe and practically equal to God or something like that and uh, and to see all other people for example as uh, potential servants or, or at least uh, people that you could inflict your own desires and uh, and fantasies and so forth on and that this is uh, this organ because it made people see things this way meant that they would not see uh, whatever it was they were not supposed to see hmm. that would have been dangerous. and But that this organ later becomes, became superfluous and it was removed so that it's no longer obligatory for people to see things upside down. But my, by momentum, they still continue to do so. Hmm. And, and as a result, you... You've, you hear the, you see the phrase repeated many, many times in his famous book, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson, the consequences of the organ Kunda buffer, which includes all of the different uh, evil factors in in the human in human life, uh, ranging from greed to war to uh, power of certain people over certain other people. All of that. It's it's a con there are consequences of the organ kunda buffer, the lack of real education, or the, the the bad quality of education, where 
the feelings are not educated, where the mind alone is educated. Uh, and so these are all consequences of, organ, of the organ kundavara. Even though the, the organ itself has been removed, uh, the consequences are still there. Hmm. Seems to me almost as if it's a kind of a shorthand for yes. these concepts. Shorthand for many, many different things. Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> did, he, did he make up a lot of uh, words like that? <laughs> yeah, at least 342 by my count. Wow. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. I use the tools that you have available, I guess, to teach. <laughs> right. Uh, um, can we talk about, uh, we were talking a little bit about Beelzebub's tales to his grandson. Yeah. And can we talk a little bit about that? What was that book about? Why was that book written? Well, he... He explains the first chapter of the book is kind of an introduction about why he wrote it and how he wrote it, although you, you can't necessarily take all of that literally either. But he said that uh, he wanted, well, the very opening fra uh, sentence in the book, let me just open it here and make sure I get it exactly right because it's important. Uh, he says that his aim in this book was to destroy mercilessly without any compromises whatsoever in the mentation and feelings of the reader, the beliefs and views by centuries rooted in him about everything existing in the world. So, uh, uh, and the way he proposes to do that is not by the usual means of describing some higher world or something, which is the approach taken in a lot of scripture, let's say, or our philosophical writings too, Plato and so forth, this world of ideas, but by telling stories which uh, communicate not to the conscious mind, but to the unconscious mind, because they evoke images, they evoke sensations, they evoke feelings, and it, even if you even if you don't agree with the story or don't like it or which it would be true for many of the stories in Beelzebub's tales most people have uh, pretty strong reactions to some of those stories still it's left its mark and uh, you remember it mm. uh, and this is this is why he wrote an, and and the first the first aspect of his story is Beelzebub the personality of Beelzebub himself who in the story was exiled from his home planet because of messing around in something that was none of his business and causing all sorts of problems. So he was exiled to this very remote solar system in which we live. And he lived on the planet Mars and observed the plant goings on on the planet Earth through a powerful telescope and also uh, in the course of six trips that he took to the surface of the planet. And you can roughly identify some of the periods in which these trips were supposed to have taken place. And the last one could be considered possibly autobiographical, kind of like the last incarnation is Gurdjieff's own, although that's not really the total story, but that, that's one way of reading it. Uh, so it's, it's a big book, quite a read difficult and it has all these words in it that he made up <laughs> uh, and a very unique way of using language sometimes one sentence will go on for two pages and wow. it's hard to keep track of exactly where he started or what he was saying <laughs> and that was deliberate to make you have to pay attention sure I I love reading the, one of the one of his recommendations was you, you read it through like you would any other book second time read it out loud as if to another person and the third time when you read it try to fathom the gist of what he has to say and I've read it out loud in groups and I've been reading it out loud on my own as part of my practice and right. those words themselves um, are an incredible amount of work because they're completely unfamiliar and I'm stumbling all over myself which of course is an exercise and a bit of humility but 
Uh, one of the things about reading out loud and reading that kind of difficult material out loud is seeing how unconsciously I normally read. I actually will, for example, skip ahead and actually try and fill in words based on the context even though uh, those words aren't actually on the page. And mm. it's for me, it's an indication of just how, you know, in my dream state or instead of waking sleep, how out of sync it is with the body that's actually looking at that page and speaking the words go in, something uh, is asleep, and the words that come out are not those that are on the page. So again, talking mm -hmm. about the body, but not necessarily in the sense of movements or hand movements, but actually uh, that reading alone has been a, a fascinating uh, work yeah, for me. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And there's many aspects of, of reading the tone of voice and the expression that, that one finds. Uh, for example, if you if you read scripture, let's say the Psalms, you read that in a very different uh, tone and vibration than if you're reading uh, the National Enquirer or something like that. <laughs> um, and other things too, one, one very useful exercise in reading any any book aloud but especially to other people but especially Beelzebub is to try and grasp what it is you're reading what what the sentence that you're about to read or that you are reading is actually saying and this is not always so easy and in, in, in Beelzebub tells it's especially not so easy when the paragraphs go on with subordinate clauses and twist and turn it really really demands something of the mind to stay with it. I remember reading stories from the people that Mr. Gurdjieff was working with, particularly while the book was uh, still being written, and he, they might read for hours and hours on end. He had a group of women uh, called The Rope that he worked with, right. and there was a story that uh, one day he called up and around 6, he said, I'm going to be over at 9 and we're going to have a meeting, and they were already incredibly tired, but so he got there at nine, and from and, until three in the morning, they they read, and it was right. this, they said that they were, and the interesting thing that, they, that she said was, we, we were powered by our super effort and his dynamo. Yes. And she used the word dynamo, that, that, that his Absolutely. presence there and their super effort right. came together to give them that energy, and it's kind of remarkable. You don't think about, um, we talk about, you know, sweating to the oldies or something. <laughs> we don't think of reading as an exercise, but when you see what he did with mm -hmm. that book, it's pretty remarkable. Yes, yeah. So, um, just uh, continuing on the list here that, uh, that Jonathan made for me, which is uh, fantastic, and again, <laughs> forgive my ignorance here. Um, what, is, what is food for the moon? Well, that's another difficult uh, we only pick the difficult question. ones here. Yeah, yeah, right. The moon, what is the moon? Uh, it's a symbol of something. Uh, one of the things he says about his method of writing is that it uses as a symbolic method. That um, uh, a symbol, and by the way, are you aware of the distinction which has been made uh, by a number of people studying some symbols that there's a difference between a symbol and a metaphor. A metaphor or an allegory is uh, something that stands for something else which could have been expressed in different words. Uh, but a symbol is not a representation of anything else. It's something of its own. Uh, of its own. Mm. And it exists in a way independent of, uh, of whether it can be applied to anything else or not. And people, I think, in the 20th century, philosophers of religion often say that religious ideas, for example, God and so forth, are symbols in that sense. That it's not an allegory or metaphor for something. It's, uh, it's, it's something of its own nature and has to be understood in its own terms. And a symbol is also inexhaustible. You can, you can never explain it away. You can never ful fully uh, explain what's in a symbol because there's always something else that you didn't uh, know about or you didn't weren't sensitive enough to find. Hmm. And the moon is a, is a symbol in, in his system. 
So anything that I say will only be very partial. Mm -hmm. uh, it represents the mechanical part of life. Uh, it's kind of like the pendulum on a clock that that regulates its uh, regulates its rate of movement, uh, and that also continues to make it move in a in a in a predictable way. It, it's like the pendulums of human life, you know, the swing from from war to peace, from uh, inflation to deflation, from from anarchy to fascism. These are these are mechanical pendulums. They they simply go, and we get caught up in them, and we think there's something special about the particular time we mm -hmm. live in that it's going one way or the other, and it's all bad and it's getting worse, but it's not. It's just a pendulum. It's mechanical. And human human life is meant as food for the for the moon in the sense that it's the energies of human life that keep the pendulum swinging without our knowing it and without our our willing our willingness to do it we just do it because we respond to all these forces in the way we respond you know we we get upset if there are terrorists and and then we think oh we have to have a war and wipe out the terrorists and and pretty soon there's a big war and then in the war people start thinking oh well we this is really terrible we've got to have peace and then pretty soon there's an era of of peace but possibly possibly that's even worse than the war so <laughs> <laughs> uh and then the other really interesting thing that he says which is quite quite a challenge it's like a koan uh, he says you have to create moon in yourself and you need to f to create this moon and feed it so that your energies don't just go to feeding this mechanical moon that we were just talking about but feed something that is like a regulating uh, organ a center of gravity again within oneself and that this needs to be fed. One's, one's blood, sweat, and tears need, and, and other energies need to go to feeding this moon in oneself. All right. Uh, <laughs> these are these are difficult concepts. Yeah, yeah, you know, I remember when that was actually brought up at one of uh, the foundation work weekends here in Chicago, and it was brought up. It was it was brought up and it was kind of left hanging. Uh -huh. um, you know, yeah. that, it was one of the things that Mr. Gurdjieff allegedly said on his deathbed was must make moon. And right. we were all very puzzled and we were all saying moon. And finally, the elder from out of town started laughing at us and said, we look like a bunch of cows all saying moon <laughs> uh, at, at her at the same time. Yeah. And that's something that I've pondered, and I have, I, I fully admit my complete ignorance. It's something that I've, I'm pondering and working with, but it's definitely a very difficult thing, but I, I stick with it. Right. Good. <laughs> it's, it's, like a co it's like I said, a koan, you know, which can never really be solved, mm -hmm. but can be constantly pondered and it is constantly fresh, constantly gives an opening to, to new new depths mm -hmm. yeah so i'm certainly going to give that some thought uh, <laughs> yeah um what is the law of seven uh the law of seven uh is that things happen in everything that happens goes in stages and some people make a fetish out of the sevenness of it but uh i i think that that's a mistake that, that every every process uh, has two places in it where the the rate of the rate of the process or the direction of it uh, change, which he calls the intervals. And by analogy with the the musical octave, the law of seven is sometimes called the law of octaves. Mm -hmm. um, in the musical octave, the, the regular scale do re mi fa so la si do. There's a a special. There's a short a shorter step between me and fa and also between si and do than mm -hmm. the other steps and he calls those the intervals of the octave 
and he says that in any process you can identify these two particular intervals, the MIFA interval and the CDO interval, and that both of them, uh, the the process changes its direction, and as it goes on, it may ch it may go through several octaves and eventually change and go in exactly the opposite way that it was going in the first. And and an example he gives is religion which starts off as something good and beneficial for man and leading to uh, to higher uh, whatever. <laughs> but that by, by little changes and big changes, it eventually becomes something almost the opposite of, of good. You know, we find people in the name of religion killing other people because they don't believe the same thing uh, or enslaving them or something like that. Um, but more closer to where we live, everything that we do, whether it's a, a job or, uh, or or this conversation, uh, it has these intervals in it. And if you understand the law of seven and you want to make a process go in a certain direction, you have to recognize the intervals, and it is possible to recognize them, and what's called fill them, insert some sort of special new energy uh, at the appropriate place in the octave and the energy is different at different times so it's 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 always a, a creative challenge to f to find exactly what is needed that is missing this is the message of the interval what's missing that'll do it for part three of our conversation with richard hodges on the gnosis of gurdjieff in part four, we wrap up our conversation and we talk about the laws of three and seven and how they relate to the Enneagram diagram. We're going to talk about uh, movement as a spiritual practice in the, in the Gurdjieff system and, we're, and a little bit about the sacred dance that happens there. And then we're going to close things out with a conversation about the fourth way and Gnosticism and how they relate and uh, all that stuff. And then, of course, some book recommendations. Uh, and all of that towards the end of the episode. So we hope that you stick around for that, and we will see you next week.